Hi, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome everybody uh, to this discussion. Uh, today we are going to discuss a very interesting topic. Um, we are Nelson Diaz here with us. Um, he is uh, from Portugal and he's going to talk about particip participatory budgeting in Portugal. Uh, we're going to talk about Cascais, which is a wee town in Portugal. And uh, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Um, the members of the council, people from the other side of the planet, and the students as well. So thank you, Nelson. Sí, sí, así es. Quisiera brevemente presentar a nuestro invitado el día de hoy. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to introduce Nelson uh, first, and the interpreter apologizes because the audio is not great for interpreting. Um, so, my apologies. Participación ciudadana. Si gustas presentarte rápido, estimado César, para que te conozcan y te escuchen todas y todos. Por supuesto. Muchísimas gracias por la invitación y bueno, muy interesados en conocer estas. Thank you. Um, we are uh, from Calisco. We've um, discussed and we progressed uh, when it comes to the budgeting. And the experiences uh, that we have are very local. So it's very exciting to hear about experiences from other countries abroad. And uh, our feedback, we've been gathering feedback from the experiences and the things that we've already done, and they are very positive uh, so far. And I think this discussion is going to help us to gather more information that we can also uh, implement at some point. And thank you again from our team. Thank you again. You're very welcome. We're very pleased to have you here and I hope you can enjoy the session and you can use the information as well. Nelson, um, the floor is yours now. Hello, good evening, good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm going to talk about the participants the budgeting and my experience in my region and in Portugal. And I think you can see my slide just now, yeah? That's correct, yeah, okay. And as uh, you may know, we do have a budgeting method that is quite extended abroad and across the world. However, the number of finance and budgets that we were getting it went down through the pandemic. Um, but now we cannot bounce back and we have different uh, participatory, participatory budgeting. And we have different regions and counties and countries that are contributing as well. Most of the budget we get is from the local governments and the local authorities. But I'm here today to talk about the whole process and how we manage the budget that we get and how do we deal with everything we do in my region. Uh, I'm going to share with you successful stories and successful cases. And I, I find them very, very interesting and very you know, um, quite fulfilling. And if you have any question uh, throughout the session, just let me know. You can either uh, drop a message on the chat or you can just raise your hand using the emoji. So first of all, I'm just going to present to you the village. Um, we're talking about Gasky, Gaskais, sorry. Um, if you look at the map, uh, we divide the region within uh, four districts across the region. 
and you can see the names uh, on the screen. Cascais is a very small town under 200,000 uh, inhabitants, but it's a very multicultural um, place and town. And we have uh, people from uh, different uh, countries, and you can see that on the street, on the buildings, uh, on schools as well, when it comes to the languages. It's a very, very small town, less than 100 acres. Hasta el momento se realizaron 10... Diez ediciones del presupuesto participativo. Esos son... We've seen 10 editions for the budgeting. Um, and in total, we've, been count we've counted 51 million euros in budget, which means that uh, we've managed to get done and they uh, promote 200 and so 218 projects which means that we've seen over 15,000 participants as well y a cada edición hay... and in each of the editions that we've promoted uh, we've encouraged different people to participate the reason why the numbers are so volatile and they are not uh, consistent is because uh, we we've seen that the numbers were going down during the pandemic, but then they went up again. So it's been changing for the last 10 editions that we've carried out. Um, we've also noticed that uh, the last edition there was more people voting uh, than ever, which is great. Which is, to be fair, is a higher number than people voting in the local local. local elections and uh, we already started nearly 11,000 votes. Sorry, Nathan, uh, Marta here. Um, just uh, to compare, because we have a students uh, here um, and uh, if you guys want to speak just go ahead um because we have uh, as i said Nelson and marta uh, who are representative from the councils could you nelson give us a rough idea for example comparing the figures you're showing us to the figures in madrid moderately it's just roughly sorry i'm not too sure if i I'm not too sure if I understood the question or if I heard it. Okay, Marta, I'm not too sure at the moment, but can have a look. We have roughly half a million uh, euros. <clears throat> And uh, 11,000 uh, votes, uh, and I don't know the other figures, sorry. Thank you. Um, I just was just asking out of curiosity, and I think it's very um, interesting for the students uh, because they can compare the both figures from Portugal and Madrid. Because in comparison, uh, Madrid, uh, the, 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 the regions are smaller, and the social awareness that there is about this kind of acts is not as big as in Portugal. And uh, I wanted to highlight uh, the figures so the students can have a rough idea and a, a Proxima idea of how this works. Perdón, buenas tardes. Me presento, que es que yo no, no me he presentado. Hi, um, I just want to choose myself as well. Um, and my name is Isabel. And I'm, 
and I'm working along with Christina Ferrando. And I just wanted to give you another figure as well, which is the most brought it, voted project. They had 4,000 uh, votes. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, if you want to have a better idea of the figures, um, and I can share this with you because I've been uh, working on this for a few years now, and I can say for a certain that the first edition had a very tiny number of votes. Although the first edition had a figure, a bigger number than the second edition for some reason, and this has not been always the same case, um, and as I was highlighting, it was due to the pandemic that the numbers were changing that much. And in Cascais, we see that we split the budget in three. And every phase, sorry, yeah, every phase has its own phase at the same time. For example, if we have the fiscal year in mind, and that would be the decision maker phase. So we have to decide what we want to work on in order to make sure we have the correct figures for the fiscal year. This is like a new phase that we are investing right now. In a normal situation, we won't be starting now. We will be starting thinking about this phase at the beginning of the year, so let's say January, because it's a very long and tedious process. So if you started like in September of October, it's not enough time to carry out a proper project. And then uh, we look at the public participation and the local authorities' participation. Terminada la sesión de públicas de participación, ¿qué es lo One, we, we, sorry, once we know what kind of uh, authorities are participating, we take the third phase into a technical analysis. So we kind of evaluate and we discuss the proposals that we received and then we analyze them. After that, we come up with a preliminary list with all the proposals that we think can go um, to the election. Of course, it's a preliminary list because the citizens and the participants can choose and this is something that has to be done by law. So citizens can... Um, give their opinion and express themselves uh, of what, what they think about the list and they can see if they disagree or not. So this is the reason why we come up with the same draft or this preliminary list. We do not include new elements, it's just a number of proposals that we think that can go life and they can be suitable for the kind of projects we work on and again by law every all the citizens can have the right to express their opinion about this list the, the proyectos que van para votación y de propuestas que fueran excluidas y ahí empieza la votación pública that's when we start with the public voting stage, which will last around one month, one month and one or two weeks. It really depends on the calendar. In a normal year, this takes place at the end of October and until the, end, the start of December, more or less. 
so that we can later announce the outcomes. This is a public ceremony, an open ceremony, open, I mean, to all the citizens where we got the mayor and all their all their cabinet to explain the outcomes of the participatory process with the stages that we can see on the screen. That's how we close the decision stage. That's because we finally decide on the winning project. And then there's a fiscal year or civil year that is y las propuestas. defined by the execution cycle. Now, the proposals will have to undergo same criteria and the maximum value is for the per proposal is 350,000 euros. We will not accept proposals that have a higher value. And this has to do with many different reasons. So one of them is that any proposal representing an expense higher than 350,000 euros implies an authorization by the general accounts uh, court. And this means basically delaying deadlines and stages for analysis and this would stop the proposal from moving on to the voting stage until there was a decision a ruling by the court so that's the main reason why we implement these deadlines so up to 350 euros you don't need any authority by the general accounting court now, the proposals, the winning proposals, can be executed in two years. That is 24 months, and in some exceptional cases that have to do with the need for a public tender. A bit, I mean, yeah, a public contract. In those cases, there is a possibility when the legal entity or the legal mechanism is the tender, the proposal can be executed in three years instead of two years. But normally we would spend two years on the execution cycle and only the projects going out to tender will be executed in three years. This is all established in the rules of the process. It's a public municipal regulation. There's a third cycle, which we call the management cycle. Now, why is this within the participatory budget? Well, because we believe that there are some fragilities in the process or gaps if we do not incorporate it. Why? Because what we do in the management cycle is focus on procurement for the projects maintenance for the pro uh, sorry the procurement of resources for the projects there are some projects that have to do with services and other with construction works now somebody needs to be responsible of their maintenance maybe the municipality or other entities hired by the municipality but that's why it's important that we foresee the management cycle within the part of the participatory budget, including the management of these projects. Sorry, Nelson, may I interrupt you? Sorry, there's a second thing within the management cycle that I would like to highlight, which is assessing the impact of each project. This can only be done once the projects have been implemented so that we can collect data about how the about their performance and how well they're doing. So the management cycle is placed at the end, but it's a cross-sectional cycle, in fact, because all the projects of the 10 editions have undergone this cycle. We monitor, we carry out the maintenance of these projects, and we assess their impact in the territory. Christina, sorry, would you like to make any remark? You just answered my question. So I understand that the whole maintenance part of the projects that are being executed, the cost of these are not included in the 300,000 euros that you mentioned. No, that's right. 
There are a couple of questions on the chat that have to do with deadlines. So from Valencia, Gustavo is asking, do you always repeat the same calendar, the same dates, the same deadlines? And there's another question about electoral processes. If you change the months or the or the dates if any of the cycles are suspended thank you very much because i am sharing my screen i cannot see the chat so thank you for highlighting the questions that are being asked so until last year the participatory budget had different dates participation started in january and the outcomes were analyzed in or provided in december now the next year we would start with execute the execution cycle straight away but we are basically changing this calendar for a specific re reason so with the traditional cycles the analysis the technical analysis part of of the project would be carried out in summer and in summer there are fewer people to work on them so it was extremely complicated to carry out an exo uh, comprehensive analysis throughout the summer months. So that's why we are now changing the cycle so that they take place in different months. So now the technical analysis can start in December and can finish in March. In December, other people take holidays because it's Christmas, naturally. This is uh, normal, so we do see some difficulties to there, but the technical analysis is so fundamental, such a key stage of the process that any mistake in the technical analysis can actually determine or lead to problems in the execution of a winning project. A proposal that is not well analyzed can always become a huge burden in the execution phase, and that's why we are now adapting the cycle so that the technical analysis phase doesn't have take place in summer months because many people are on holidays in the north of Europe, sorry, in the northern hemisphere. We're talking about the July, the months of July and August. So this is a very complicated period to carry out the technical analysis. Now in this analysis stage, that's when you you Calculate the budgets for each proposal. I'm going to talk about the technical analysis later on, but it includes this criteria. Now, Luis, I think there was a second question I forgot to answer. So another of our participants, Joanna, was asking about the electoral processes. If we have general elections, is the process suspended or delayed, postponed? Well, municipal elections, take place in Portugal every four years. Generally in the month of in the month of September. At the end of September more or less or start of October, that's when we have municipal elections in Portugal so that the new cabinet can get to work straight away and approve and pass the, the budget for the next for the following year. But since we started this process in Cascais, we have only suspended this process one year, and it was during the pandemic year. In electoral years, we do not suspend these stages. And this is a political decision that is clear. What's clear is that participatory budgets have nothing to do with who's in government. When people vote, Participatory budgeting, they are not voting something that has to do with politics or the municipal elections. This was a very key message to share because unconsciously, I'd say, uh, you want to force all candidates to include participatory budgets in all the, pro all the manifestos of every party. This is a personal point of view, my personal opinion, I don't think any candidate should or would have the courage. Yeah, the courage to say in their manifestos, they're going to interrupt the participatory budgeting 
processes where millions of people are voting. More people vote sometimes in participatory budgets than municipal ele elections. No candidate would be would miss this opportunity and would say that they are not going to continue the participatory budgets because they might not agree with all the aspects of the model, but there's a general agreement that this is a key process for our community, so we should never interrupt it because there are elections. Now, something else that happens in Portugal is that the National Elections Commission tries and has been trying for years to forbid the implementation of participatory budgeting processes during electoral years, but this has nothing to do with Kafkai specifically. May I continue? There's a question in the chat by Maria saying, so the technical analysis you were mentioning, did it include any sort of environmental assessment? Yes, of course, I'm going to talk uh, and get into the different stages and the content of the technical analysis. And if I forget to do so, please remind me. So. The preparation face, as you can see on the screen, in the pictures on the right, it starts in January. In January, we always have meetings. And one of the most important of these meetings is to gather the whole participatory budget team. We're talking about three, four permanent members in the team working within a citizenship department with around 35 to 40 technical officials, officers or technicians. So there's a municipal department for citizenship and within this department, you can find three main teams, one of which is all about the participatory budgets. So together with the team in charge of this department and this team in charge of participatory budgeting, every year before we start the new edition, we carry out an assessment, a thorough assessment of the process. What went well, what could have been improved, what we should maybe change to enhance the process. And in this meeting, or this meeting is also organized for other departments, maybe the one analyzing technically the feasibility of the proposals and analyzing through our services, what should be improved, what went really well, what didn't. There's a third meeting with our citizens, with those who participated in this edition. And there are several criteria, should we include men, women, the youth, the elderly, people who are in charge of winning projects, people in charge of the projects that didn't get to the next round, because we want a very representative assessment of the edition that we have just concluded so that we can have a clear vision of from our citizens of what we should be aiming to improve in the next edition. So every year we carry out these three meetings, we hold these three meetings and we work on the statistical data about the profiles of all the citizens who participated in the projects, the projects that were submitted, the winning projects, etc. So there's a whole statistical system and data infrastructure that we work on in the preparation stage. Now, why do we need this preparation stage? Because we want to review process and the standards. Every year, we try to review the standards and make small amendments. That's why we make the most of this stage to also train our staff, our team, they need to fully understand what will change with the new standards. And we need to prepare the public stages of participation where citizens will be debating their proposals and submitting their input. We need for all of this, we require a moderator's team and this team needs to be trained accordingly. 
throughout the preparation stage, we also organize briefing sessions for citizens because we want to reach new audiences to enhance the process and to tell them the changes that we are going to introduce in the new edition. These changes result from the assessment carried out previously. That's what we see in the preparation stage, basically. We also start to work on public communications. Every year we design a, commu a comms plan we decide how we will be communicating this participatory process, the key messages that we want to convey to our population. And what you can see on the screen are examples of our communication strategy. What do we want to highlight about the process at every stage? How do we want this process to be appealing or attract people? And sometimes the target is our citizens and we include in these communications people who might be well known in the municipality. For instance, take a look at this flyer on the screen. This is one of our citizens who is in charge of the proposal. Yo creé este, este she created this space. This was a winning proposal, so she was included in the flyer. It's a way to basically get the, the citizens to speak on behalf of the city council. This is a fundamental part of the process, detailing the whole communications process for the whole this decision cycle. We will have to communicate to reach out to our citizens over and over again to encourage them to participate in public sessions so that they participate in the technical analysis and in the voting processes. So it's extremely demanding to reach out to them with so many communications. So that's why we have a very specific and detailed communications calendar. If you look at the screen, you'll see a picture of a particip public participation session. We have two sessions in both locations, they take place in the evening. Well, the first one takes place in the evening during the week and the second one in the afternoon on Saturday, because so it might be easier for some people to spend time in these sessions during the week and others prefer to participate or it's more convenient for them to participate in, on Saturday. So again, in each of the churches or the that we use as locations. We will carry out two meetings and we will hold the first one during the week and the second one on Saturday afternoon. Why is this picture important? Because it is really revealing. You see the, the room is full of people and they're organized in groups. This is not an assembly. This is not an assembly set up. Now, we are working on a model based on teams. We are not confronting them in groups. We are not splitting them up so that they confront each other. No, what we want is for them to have the opportunity to speak. And what better way to do so than splitting them in very small groups. Some people find it easier to express themselves or speak in front of others. So that's why we choose to make small groups so that they all feel comfortable to present, to submit their ideas, to exchange. And in every one of these tables, round tables, you will see an officer from the city council. These are the moderators that we have appointed to facilitate dialogue. We don't want them to have an impact on the debate. Instead, they're there to manage time, provide information. Entonces, eso es lo que, lo que decía antes. So as I was saying before, the sessions are open to the public, uh, both the inhabitants, the students, 
And if they are over 12 years old, then they are welcome to come. There's two public sessions, each civil parish, and all the money gathered has to be donated to that civil parish. In the civil parish, the, you have the opportunity to have interpreters and translations as well. But, well, in this case, this is my own translation. And uh, we also have a sign language interpreting in Portuguese. So if we have a look at the map again, uh, we can see that the in the county we have eight civil parish for two in each. And we have also eight sessions, two in each civil parish. And we also have a common a meeting point and the main square. And also going back to the language, if we do have the interpreting and translation services uh, available when voting and making and drawing up proposals, and we encourage people to use the English language. And the reason is because we have 20% of the population that live in Cascais that are foreigners. Sorry, I think somebody's trying to talk. Okay, sorry, yes, uh, from the Gran Granada Council. They're asking if there is a similar, there's a similar activity and proposal uh, nationally or if it's done locally and if so, what kind of rules and laws do you follow? We do have a loss and we do have rules as well. We do have a national rule related to the budgeting across a across the whole country and this is regulated by the the educational ministry. Um, but if you're talking about each individual uh, county, no, it's it's uh, down to the local authorities. Um, okay, um, so going back to the beginning of uh, this project, there was a big tension and friction uh, between the local authorities and the government. Okay. Uh, and it's easy to understand because it is, it's very difficult to create a network that supports the projects. Uh, we're talking about a local level. Um, but of course, the government wants to make sure uh, they, they can do something like this on a national level. Um, so from this frictions, uh, we came up with two kind of proposals. Uh, number one or A is a proposal that that aims to benefit the activities and the users. And they can make and draw up proposals on behalf of somebody else. So that would be the first kind of proposals. And then number two or B. They are the other kind of proposal that do not benefit the proposers number A or letter A. The second ones are not implemented yet and they have or they have to follow the specific laws and the specific rules uh, when it comes to 
when it comes to the legal uh, departments and representatives. Just to give you figures, it's uh, because it, it generates and it, it's kind of a, gives a lot of budget every year. We're talking about more than like five million euros. But when we're talking about participatory budgeting, the budget that we get is divided and it's uh, distributed accordingly across the two proposals. And the the reason why we came up with this two proposal it was to kind of um, slow down or make sure that the frictions and the tension between both parties were were not that high. And how we do proceed when we are organising election. Well, when we start today, we just we just welcome the attendees. And then we tell them where they go, where they have to go to. What kind of what kind of um, table they have, and we assign the tables. The we assign the tables um, according to the number of people we receive. We give them a, a batch. And this is um, just uh, to organize uh, the meeting and to organize the people so they are not sitting randomly and we have a control over the attendees. So. For each public session, a person can propose one proposal. If we have a table of five people, five attendees, we will have five proposals. Then you propose your idea, you discuss with the rest of the attendees on your table, and then the moderator organizes the debate and everything. And at the end of the session, you will have one proposal for each table, one proposal A and the other one proposal B. And we organise as well a debate so that all the attendees eh, have an idea of what kind of proposal they've been discussed. Then we gather all the proposals A and all the proposals B, and we give the chance or we give the chance to the person that's made the proposal to explain themselves and to present the proposal to the rest of the attendees. Each session, attendees have a limited number of proposals that they can draw. And this number depends on the number of participants as well, which means if we have more attendees, more proposals can be drawn up. So this is a way for us to challenge uh, the civil parish, uh, to encourage more people to come along, because the, ha the, the higher the number of participants is, the higher the number of proposals is as well. So at the end of the day, we need to have one proposal A and one proposal B. But if you have a look at the screen and down the bottom, you will see how many proposals we can have in comparison to the number of participants we have. So from 1 to 60, 
two proposals, one A and one B. Um, uh, more than 121 participants. We have six, three proposals A and three proposals B. We revise and we go through the rules every year to make to every year, sorry, to make sure we are fair and we act according to the law. Entonces se limita, se, se crea un límite de propuestas que se puede analizar. And uh, we also want to make sure we have just uh, the fair number of proposals because then we have to analyze them and we have to go through the technical in an analysis. And we also want to make sure we have a fair number of proposals because we want all the citizens and all the people that are uh, attending to the civil parish to, to make sure their voice is heard off and to make sure they are included and feel included with their votes and their proposals too. Do you have any questions so far? Yes. Um, how do you make sure the citizens uh, have the identification they say they have? They don't need to say, okay, I am representing proposals A or proposals B. They don't need to say where or who they are representing to. They are just, they, they just need to say the one kind of proposal they want to, to propose. That's all. Um, but again, because we're doing the technical analysis of the proposals, we it would be easy for us to find out if they meet the criteria and the needs to push and to with to 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 draw up the proposal. Entendido, gracias. Nelson, perdona, he hecho, he, he, había hecho yo esa pregunta, pero precisamente... Nelson, I'm so sorry. I actually asked the same question eh, precisely because we are finding, especially in the football area, um, for example, pero... we know that uh, certain uh, football clubs they do have support from other channels. But imagine there's a citizen that says, I would like to improve um, certain rules or laws um, of this uh, club, or I would like to, to see some improvements on the football pitch. Um, so what I'm trying to see is, how do you make sure they, they say they, that they draw up the proposal they say they will draw up, if it makes sense? Yes, I understand. Well, um, we need to check if they drawn up the proposal properly. And this is why we carry out the technical analysis. And this is why when there's a group discussion to make sure that the proposal meet the criteria. No importa si la propiedad es pública o privada. The first uh, criteria or the first uh, element to bear in mind is it's the, the property. When I talk about property, I mean in terms of legal terms. We need to make sure that we can um, give the support to this property. The second one is the maintenance. Hey, when I um, refer to maintenance, I refer to the liability of the project, which means we have to make sure we could or we can continue supporting this uh, property over the course of a few years or a period of a few years, we can just uh, approve a project in the short term. 
Entonces, la manutención puede ser pública o privada. And again, the the way we support the property can be public or a private channel. It doesn't matter. And then the third criteria or element to bear in mind is the access to the to the proposal, which means that we can approve the project or we can not um, push forward the project if the proposal is not accessible for everybody. Again, the access to this proposal has to be public and universal. Porque como están también nuestros alumnos del, del máster, eh, eh, o sea, las, las, las vinculaciones urbanísticas ¿no? de, este tipo de, de este tipo de procesos. Y, y me uno también a, o sea, es decir, um, es muy interesante el que este tipo de propuestas eh, se puedan hacer. I also wanted to ask about the urban area and how pushing forward a project like that on a uh, public soil and private soil, what's the difference between um, both of us? And urbanístico hay dotaciones que pueden ser públicas o pueden ser dotaciones eh, privadas. What I'm trying to say is that uh, there's a big difference between private and public soil when it comes to urban planning and in Spain for example public soils that are constructed or they are approved for exploitation then they are sold to a third party so it becomes a private soil but it was private public soil before and you were talking about accessibility, but what would it happen then? Uh, just to give you an example, if we're talking about nurseries or... Or any, any, any other kind of a public institution, I really liked the way you exposed the three criteria and the three elements that are very important for you to push a forward a project because I think they are key when it comes to to allocating uh, projects to both private and public parties. Y la propuesta fue presentada para mejorar la pista que existía, que, que no estaba en buena... Ok, just to give you an example, we got a proposal of a training course. We, the, there was a bunch of people that wanted to maintain, to keep uh, their private training course. But the idea was that in order for it to to be the way it was, it had to become of a public use. So here we were not a uh, budgeting a private use of a public space. It was the other way around. And we were just working around the theme of accessibility to make sure that the user we are um we're getting the services that we're waiting for. That, that's absolutely wonderful and I completely understand what you're trying to, to get across. So thank you very much. I've got another question, which I think is key as well. Because this kind of project that can be a bit disruptive in, in the sense of there's a, a urban planning that needs to be followed and all of a sudden can be changed or can be twisted. Um, but what we are seeing with uh, your your examples and throughout your, your discussion and presentation is that um, it should be a priority when it comes to 
um, starting new projects or a continuing with some projects so that we have a list of projects that needs to be done now or can be do, can be carried out later on and therefore we would have more room to play with the budgets. And uh, this is um, essentially and uh, precisely the strategic the, the, the strategy that we should follow. Yeah. Recuperando la información. We are trying to recover all the information that we didn't collect at the start to assess more than two hundred projects and that specific addition to understand the number of projects that we didn't foresee that we'd be implementing or executing instead the not only that we didn't expect to implement it but also that the cabinet wouldn't because there are proposals that our team or saw and or didn't foresee but they sometimes decide that they would never implement this process proposal because of the participatory process they end up doing so i'd say we are talking about 80 85 percent what i mean is the participatory budget includes 80 85 percent of investment in proposals that would have otherwise not have been implemented and there are other cases and i don't have the figures here but i know that some projects turned into public policy with 350,000 euros a project was carried out and the municipality understood that the idea was so amazing that they turned it into policy that has happened in specific cases I don't know how you want to continue I see you raise your hand Christina sorry I forgot to lower my hand now let's talk about how we finish the pub, public participation sessions. After we close these meetings, we look at the technical analysis and all the proposal excluded by citizens, the, one, the ones that, that don't move on to the next round, are then assessed by the municipality because they might, at a certain point, be interested in executing one of these. So the proposals lost in this phase that are not approved by the assemblies or public sessions of our citizens are not excluded 100%. Instead, they are submitted to the cabinet so that they can be assessed. And if they agree with one of these, they might be implemented and executed outside of the participatory budget. What do we do in this phase? Well, we hire all the areas that are relevant to the proposal. If it's sports, healthcare, education, financial activities, public spaces, green spaces, mobility, whatever it is, all the areas are eligible when we talk about these kinds of programs and each service comes with a file with the criteria defined in standards and which are public. All services need to analyze proposal following the same criteria and to say for each criteria if it is respected, if it is complied with or not, and if they comply with this standard that or with this criteria, fine. And if not, you need to justify why not. Because in some cases, you might be able to adjust to tweak the proposal so that it complies with specific uh, legal standard or another kind of criteria. So there are several admission criteria for the proposals. And out of the list, these are the two most important ones. So the maximum value per project, again, 350,000 euros, as I said, and the period of execution, which is from two to three years uh, long. So for each proposal, you can imagine the humongous effort that it entails for our team. So that's why the municipality determines the maximum number of um, proposals that can be thoroughly and duly assessed for each one of the proposals we have we hold a meeting with those submitting 
the proposal, the authors of the proposal, and we visit the location for the implementation of such proposal, all the criteria, all the admission criteria are analyzed and assessed, and we calculate a budget for implementation. That is something that all projects need to need to go through. No proposal entering the technical analysis stage can move forward without that visit, that analysis of criteria, at least one with one meeting with the author, and again, analysis of all the criteria, including the budget. For instance, here you can see a picture of a group. These are the authors of the proposal. This woman that you can see on the left wearing a blue garment, she's the person in charge of the proposal. And she is guiding the team and they are debating on the spot about the the plans. So the technical analysis will lead to a, an interim list to be consulted by with the citizens. And then once we finish the legal uh, deadline, we have a to publish an official list. That's where we decide what proposals move on to the public voting stage. This, uh, this is supported by a very significant communication strategy. It is a multi-channel strategy and it is a proximity-based strategy. We communicate closer to the people affected by or impacted by the proposal. For instance, in the main mall in this municipality, we might have a permanent stand. In Cascais, we have a mall where thousands of people go shopping worldwide uh, every day. And that's way, where we decided to set a stand where we would share about the voting process of the proposals. There is a team out in the streets communicating, telling people about and spreading the word about the projects and the voting processes. These Teams can be found in the train stations and main squares and main streets. So there's a team that is per permanently out there in the street for four, six weeks, and they will be carrying out these communication efforts all day long, as well as the authors of such proposals. The authors receive a package with 2,000 postcards for each voting session, each finalist will receive this package, sorry, so that they can send out these postcards, they can mobilize people to vote. And another important aspect that I'd like to highlight is that there's been an ongoing debate on who can vote and how you can vote. As text messages, online, Everybody in the country can vote, actually, for the mayor. This is no problem. But we had to improve our system. So we decided that each postcard, each briefing letter, each leaflet, each manifesto, each document would have a unique code. You can print up to 4,000 codes. I'm trying to explain to you and to convey the complexity of the process. It's actually a bit more straightforward than it sounds. Each citizen will receive the 2000 postcard package and each of these has a different code. It will include the name and number of the project and a code for the voting stage. So when voting through text messages, they will have to include the number of the project, the unique, the, their uh, individual code. This helps people who live outside of Cascais because locally we are giving uh, leaflets and documents with a code. So what we thought would be confusing at the start, it actually turned into a monitoring process that proved extremely valuable.
because we know with our codes, through the codes, where the votes are coming from. We know that the author of a specific proposal, let's call him Antonio, received this package with 2,000 postcards, and we know the codes associated to these postcards, and we know whether the votes have been encouraged for, by the teams in the communications, efforts in the municipality, by the author. So basically, we know where these votes are coming from and what mobilization efforts have been more successful. We are not trying to identify the people voting, of course. We don't want to know who they are, but we know what, who is mobilizing these people whether it's the authors, whether it's the municipality. For instance, there's a gazette, you can see it. It's a journal, a briefing journal from our municipality. You can see it on, on the screen. It is distributed to every citizen every month. So each number of this gazette, this journal will include the individual code so that anyone voting can use it. So again, with our codes, what we try to do is to trace the source of such vote, whether they have been mobilized by the efforts of our municipality or whether it's the, the marketing strategy of, of the author. We, we don't know who they are individually, but we know the channel the mobiliza mobilization channel that is most effective. Sorry to interrupt you. May I? So in order to vote in participatory budgeting processes, you must have a code. And this code is given to you through communication leaflets or a postcard. Exactly. Everywhere where we include publicity or advertising about the voting process, there is a code in the malls, the streets, and the postcards. Specifically, the postcard packages that the author needs to give out. If the author runs out of postcards, because they've already sent 2,000 postcards, they can be provided with more postcards. That's fine. It really depends on the author's needs. So there's a question on the chat. So what percentage of the of Cascais uh, budget is allocated to participatory budgeting? Well, the highest value was 18% of investment. Thank you very much. You can vote through text messages or online. Most votes come from in the form of text messages, most people have a smartphone. They include the number of the project, the code. They can be done from anywhere. You don't need a laptop. Text message doesn't even require you to have a good Wi-Fi connection. So you, if you are offline, you can also vote. So most of our votes are sent through text messages and all citizens have the right to submit four votes, two for A-type proposals and two for B-type proposals. What does this mean in practice? That they will need two different codes. It seems complex, but in practice, it's extremely straightforward and our citizens know what it's all about. They know that they need to know the number of the project, the name of the project and the number of the code. We're talking about maybe uh, five uh, letters or five numbers. I would also like to mention an important matter. How do we analyze the channels? of our votes, of the votes we receive. So, for those who decide to vote online, they need to register in our platform where they will enter their email, their name, and their telephone. They cannot register without including these details. So, if you vote online, we already have their 
we, we automatically get their phone number. So if they later decide to vote through their text messages and we see that it's the same number, this is not allowed because it's an, a comprehensive system. So we can cross check the phone numbers. Once the voting stage is finished, we have to announce the winning projects and the outcomes of the process. You can see a picture of a presentation ceremony. You can see the mayor on stage. There were around 900 to 1,000 people. This was the municipality market. <laughs> this is our Golden Globes night in Cascais. So you can see that everybody is invited to hear about the results. Uh, nobody knows. Everybody who has a proposal will go there with their support networks. It's uh, such a, a fascinating night. There's, there are many uh, rounds of applause, many joyful moments, because we talk about a budget that can until up to 18 or on average 10 percent of our municipal budget and with such an expressive group of, of voters we are calculating the participant satisfaction rate i apologize for my spanish i don't know if i'm translating this properly says the speaker so the satisfaction rate yeah exactly thank you so how do we calculate this roughly? If 100,000 people voted in a specific edition for a participatory budget and we added the number of people voting for the winning projects and we, if we know that around 80 to 85 percent of people voted for the winning projects we know that the rest have voted projects that don't move forward move on to the next stage this 80 to 85 percent of voters will be satisfied I mean, this is obviously not a perfect method, but it's extremely revealing and it tells a lot about the satisfaction of the voters. We announce the project from the least voted one to the most voted one. And every time a project is announced, we invite the authors to come up on stage to receive this plaque that contains the information that appears in i mean it's like a simulation of a public construction work i would like to give you some examples of winning projects this one part is particularly from specifically from the first edition and it has impacted the lives of many people living next to the shopping center it's interesting because it was a very small change they the pedestrians didn't have access to the mall even though they lived extremely close to it. So we decided to create this, to build this uh, sidewalk. It was necessary to negotiate with uh, the private owner of this asset, this home that you can see on the left, to basically split the space to create the sidewalk so that there was pedestrian access to the mall. It wasn't, they weren't able to access from the road because it's a uh, highway. So this was such a specific proposal and it was so easy and tangible that it was voted by many. Sorry, Nelson, I, I'm i sorry to, to interrupt. How did you negotiate with the, with the owner? That's exactly what we did, yes. It wasn't an expropriation case. Uh, this is an example of a Type a type proposal to enhance the musical association. You can see that the building was in really, really bad state. So we basically refurbished and we redid the, the whole building. This is a very interesting proposal, creating the pedestrian sidewalk. We're talking about 300, 300 and 50 meters long sidewalk. What was the problem with this sidewalk where, well, 
on the one side, you can see there's a McDonald's, and at the other side, there is a school. 100, or sorry, hundreds of children would cross this road, and it led to many accidents. It was a, a real hazard. Now, the problem had been identified for 30 years at least. <laughs> But again, the national rules depends on the government. They are not uh, down to us. So there's always like uh, competence and the friction between the government and the local authorities that have been discussing about it say, over the last 30 years, which is incredible frustrating because they've been you know, neglecting uh, and not over, not looking at this issue. And in the meantime, citizens have been just walking through a very dangerous street. Well, not even a street, the main road. So, what happened? We uh, encourage the citizens to vote and uh, to demand the government and the local authority to resolve this issue. It wasn't resolved. It didn't get resolved at all. It got just uh, overlooked at. Um, thankfully, uh, now it, it got it, it got done, and kids and people and citizens can just walk through the street, and they have a pavement. They have a, a safe pavement and a safety road as well. And um, this is also as well uh, the results, the final result of the project. And um, this is how the school and the pavement looks now as well. And in our region, eh, we do have successful stories and successful projects. Um, we also accept proposal that might not be down to the local authorities of Cascais to resolve, but if we do have the legal competencies and the legal uh, instruments and tools to kind of deal with it, so we're happy to deal with the proposal. Um, obviously, we have to consult with the government where if this is possible for us or not. Now, we're going to move on to another example. The, this was an abandoned building, a listed building in the centre of Cascais. And today is a space where we carry out cultural activities, community activities, like a community centre type thing. Another successful experience is the one I'm sharing with you now. And it's a... The... We acquired um, more ambulances, more vehicles uh, for the firefighters. And as you may know, in our communities, the firefighters, they are not part of social services. They are volunteers. And most of the times they do not have the resources to deal with all the emergencies that pop up. So. Uh, we managed to find and to hire vehicles for them. Uh, uh, this is a, a training course. That was the case I was talking about before. That was a private uh, soil and now is in a public space. And this case right now is one of the cases that I wanted to share with you before I forget. We do have a particip participatory budgeting for young people. As you may know, under this budget, we can count with people over 12 years. The other a budgeting process, we have people that are under 12 as well. Anyway, both budgets have 
similarities, similarities sorry. Um, we open those budgets uh, to schools so students can study which of the proposals is better for their school. And they have the possibility and the chance to propose and to draw up a proposal. And their proposal goes directly into the list of the proposals that are is going to be analysed by the technical analysis team. So, one a of sorry from all the proposals we take into account most of them but the proposal that the young people proposed already represents 4 million euros which means that we automatically deliver and make sure we give 4 million euros to those proposals. Just to give you an example, this is one of the projects, which is a bus stop just right in front of the door, the main door of the school. And we also hear the voice of young people. And this is what they say. They say that once they finished the class, um, there's a, a long queue to get the bus and uh, there's no space on the bus for every single student. So, we noted their proposal, we heard them and uh, we pushed forward their proposal to expand the bus stop and to expand the bus services too. So now the students from that school um, can use public transport as well. Yes, this is also a project for a school, is a science lab. It wasn't a thing before, it doesn't exist. And some of the responsibles some of the teachers in charge of the science subjects, they said they didn't have the space, so we managed to build up that space for them. Um, as you may know, Cascais is along the coast. Um, and there was no, there was an, a, a ramp or a pavement accessible for disabled people, so we managed to build that up as, as well. We also managed to so showers in some of the sports centres, the sports facilities. And to finish off, I want to talk about how we analyse the impact that these projects have. The dots you can see on the map are the, dot, the, the projects that we've carried out along, sorry, across the country. But what I can assure you is that every single citizen in the sky lives nearby one of the projects we've been carried out. So the maximum, the distance a citizen is to get access to one of the projects we've made is under a mile. And one of the ways we have to analyse the impact is Google Maps and it's through satellites. So if we zoom in, we will have a radar, a red, a red radar that shows us the impact and the scope of the project and how many people have access to the project. And this is what we call the impact area. 
and we know roughly how many access again, sorry, how many people again they have access to the project and how many people are benefiting from the project. If we want to zoom in again, we will see red dots everywhere. Oh, sorry. I think it's a, it a, an easy way to see and to analyze the impact. And we're getting a bit technical here. We're talking about stats, but if we want to analyze the impact of the project, this is how we need to work. Uh, that also help us to uh, calculate the investment per capita, the number of people uh, that benefit from the project, the number of votes um, that uh, we registered in the area. And just to finish off, these uh, kind of budgets uh, are a tool that uh, communicates and uh, establish a communication between citizens and co local authorities and governments. We're trying to encourage people to look after their environment, to look after their own community. And the idea is to make sure the citizens and the communities are given the instruments and the tools to protect uh, their area, to participate, to be inclusive, to have a voice. And uh, when we open the votes, we make sure that both parties are heard with two votes A. E, sorry, number A, and two votes for number B. But if at any time there is a person that doesn't agree with the project that's been selected, then they can, re they can appeal, they can vote, they can give a negative vote, which means, Entonces, which means that of the total votes, that the project has received, we're going to take off the number of negative votes that the project has received. Uh, do, do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Perfecto. Yes, we understand. Thank you. So somebody can can say, okay, I want to give one vote to this project and a negative to another, or two positive votes or two negative votes. Arma de competición. Porque si yo tengo un voto positivo y un... Yes. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that the negative vote is a vote that benefits the final project, but not that a vote that turns against it, if it makes sense. And also, uh, it gives us an example, a precise example of the number of, of the opinion of the people, because you may have two votes, two negative votes, but you think there's two projects that are not good enough, so you would want to give one negative vote to one project and one negative vote to the other. Ideas, proyectos, propuestas de ámbito municipal, pero también gubernamental, como hablaba antes. And we also want to create a greater and a better communication between the citizens, the communities, and the local authorities. We also want to make sure there's a political compromise. There's a political uh, leadership. Uh, we also want to have a technical uh, team that is qualified and that they can deliver their best. It's very uh, hard and it's very rare that we listen to comments like, oh, you nailed it, because there's always something to improve on and the technical team has to be very critical, has to try to pick on up 
to pick up on the tiniest details. And we want this team also to have a political compromise. We also uh, offer trainership to the citizens to kind of train them on the projects, to explain to them what we're trying to work on, and so on. I have a nickname, which I am the critical one. Um, because, yes, I do take on part on the project, but I am very critical when it comes to picking up stuff. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for listening to me. I'm not too sure if you have any other questions, but I would be happy to answer them. Hi, Nelson. Thank you very much. I'm so sorry I was running late. Um, uh, especially to my students, because eh, I saw them this morning saying, yeah, you have to attend this meeting, and now, you know, I am the one really late. I think eh, the model that you just presented is brilliant, is something that could be a role model and could, you, could be used in other parts of the planet. I think it's a mix between a human resources and fundings and a strategies that can that could be a potential in other parts as well. Before uh, these sessions, uh, we had. We had a uh, other training uh, within the academia area. And I'm just talking about this because I would like to bring this up as well to the conversation. And thank you so much eh, for being here with us because eh, our students, I'm sure they would really, uh, they, they, they really appreciated it. And I think it's been an amazing uh, conversation, amazing discussion. Uh, we have a lot of questions. Uh, I'm not too sure if we're going to have time to go through all of them. Uh, I'm not too sure if we have time. Can somebody confirm? Mm, and the first question would be, what kind of mechanisms, what kind of resources do you have uh, to make sure you're inclusive and there's no inequality between both parties? Uh, then there's another question about what happens if uh, somebody appeals because one of their projects uh, hasn't been pushed forward. There's another question related to the access of the property. What happens if there was a private uh, property that now is public? If, is it open to the public forever or has a limited availability? How everything does it work? I'm not too sure if you want to answer to some of the questions you uh, I've just uh, asked you. Well, okay, first of all, we do have uh, groups that are not uh, included or they are misrepresented. And the ones that are misrepresented, in order to know if they are participating or not, we do have data and we do have uh, stat resources to make sure um, they participate and we can have a, a general idea of what kind of groups we're talking about, what kind of a uh, persons we're talking about and what's their background and their profile. Every person participating will be encouraged to participate in a survey. So from the get-go, from the first day of these editions, we have this, collected the surveys of all the participants. We know the details of their profile, whether they're a man, a woman, how the, how skilled they are, qualifications, place of, of residency, whether they believe or are engaged in politics or not, whether they normally vote or not, and many other profile-related traits. 
it's important to understand not only who is participating, but also the profiles that are underrepresented in these surveys. So every year we will analyze the results to understand why can't we mobilize the elderly? Traditionally, they are underrepresented in these uh, processes. It's because of this constant assessment that we are able to tweak, for instance, where we hold the public sessions so that they are closer to the profiles that are underrepresented. Or why are we not reaching out to certain areas of the municipality? Maybe the places that we are using, the locations, the assemblies are not the best suited for these kinds of people, or they don't feel that these spaces represent them well. So the assessment, the yearly assessment helps us understand what groups are excluded from the process because of different factors. Something really interesting that we can see in Cascais is that in every each and every one of the sessions in the different neighborhoods, the first question is, who is attending a participatory process for the first time? And 70, 75% of people are joining this kind of processes for the first time. So 20, 25% are the ones who are loyal to these kinds of processes, but normally there are people coming in and out of the projects the infra, this underrepresented groups are our main challenge. And this analysis, this assessment will help us target these groups more appropriately. For instance, the elderly, as I said, or the youth. We are now developing tools so that these processes are more appealing to them. Sometimes a participatory budget might not be the most appealing tool for all pro uh, profiles. And that's fine. It shouldn't have to be. But we need to provide an answer for those profiles who don't want to participate through participatory budgets, who would rather intervene or engage with other tools. Now, there was another question. Could you please remind me? There was a question about whether the losing projects can be submitted the following year. Yes, of course, every single year they can participate again. And what about the time of access when it comes to private spaces? This is calculated with formulas that I don't know how I may explain in Spanish. There is a life cycle for each public investment. And according to this calculation, we determine the time of universal access to a specific uh, asset, private asset. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, Marta, don't worry, go on. It's like a lease, an inverse uh, lease, because they are normally take place on state-owned property, but this is quite the opposite. You are leasing a space from the private owner to the public domain for public use. Exactly, that's, that's right. I don't know if we can give the floor to one of the students attending here, attending this uh, meeting. There are so many questions, I don't know which one to get to. First, Aldo, for instance, if you would like to speak up, you have a question that is interesting and complex at the same time. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for giving me the floor. So they have, I have two questions that are intertwined. So the first one was about the fact that these participatory processes can be implemented not only in municipal land, in leisure spaces, in state-owned spaces, basically, but also in private spaces and other governmental level space owned spaces. So, because resources are limited, because the budget of the municipality is limited, shouldn't 
you focus on your own assets, state-owned assets, so that we can alleviate, release a bit of the budget. Because if we add this to the duties of other levels of government, of the district, housing, education departments, uh, the province level, because money is so scarce, because resources are limited, it might be very difficult to meet all the needs that come forward. The second question has to do with the positive impact of the pro projects about land value. They might impact the value of a certain plot or land or asset. So I would like to know that given that participatory budgets are invested for a particular or specific purpose and are not associated to public work projects, are you measuring the, how the projects impact the valuation of these assets and whether this new value is used to then finance, to, to fund other projects? I would like to get to your first question first. This is a political decision, actually. The Cascais City Council decided to follow the preferences of our citizens. If they need to use a space that is not state-owned, but that many people would like to use, and if there's no problem, the municipality is available to find a solution of the sort. This is a purely political decision. We can say we are available if there's a problem in our municipality and if other government spaces are not providing a, a suitable answer to these pro problems. And if this is the case, they are at their disposal because it's about improving life, living standards in the municipality. And also, it's not the municipality voting and deciding priorities. For the municipality, it's a really interesting indicator to know that there are spaces and equipment that are not under their power, but they are in a bad state, that are maybe in a... Uh, in um, um, degraded space, for instance, the running track in the private school that was in a poor state. It was cheaper for the city council to work on this running track and to later guarantee that there was public access to it. It had to, actually, they had to uh, build a new running track, replacing Therefore, this private asset. But that was a purely political decision. Now, I don't know if I have an answer to your second question because the participatory budget was not, has not been understood so far as a tool to increase the valuation of state owned assets, specifically state owned land. But we do know that many projects are improving the valuation of many assets, but because we are not making these calculations, we calculate the value of their use for citizens. So we are not interested in speculating with these kinds of processes. I don't think these indicators have been developed so far. I think we are running out of time. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you, Nelson, for your answers. Now, the City Council of Granada, just to conclude, is asking a couple of questions. First of all, whether the complexity of participatory budgets increases over time or whether it becomes easier. And then there's another question about the expenses that are admitted within the framework of the participatory budget. Nelson, for us, there's a budget structure that is really well regulated. So, first of all, staff expenses. Secondly, um, operate, operation expenses, investments, transfers, etc. So, it's really, we're talking about limited resources. Limited expenses to uh, 
procurements, services, investments before we had other things like grants, but we don't no longer do this. Well, in our case, we're talking about expenses, not operating costs, but expenses related to public investments like construction works, purchasing goods and services, things of the sort. Thank you. Susanna, may I intervene? But there was a question before this one. Well, there was a question about whether the management of participatory budgets has become increasingly complex. It's interesting for me to share the Cas the Cascais case because I am extremely critical, optimistic at the same time. So I need to become a better critic and consultant. Sometimes the team is more critical than more uh, critical than I am. But something that is interesting in Cascais is that the the changes that we see every year aim to, are aimed at guaranteeing that there's an improvement in the conditions in which people participate, an improvement quality of the whole process in terms of their its delivery deliveries. It's not about the day-to-day, -day, improving the day-to-day -day life uh, in our municipality. This is not to make institutions' daily life easier. That's what I mean. This is happening in other places in Portugal. Some city councils have specific limitations. Limitations to execute construction works, for instance, they might tweak the process to make their lives easier. But what we want to improve are participation conditions. What we see in Cascais that is really revealing is that our team is always available to improve participation conditions and not only looking at what changes can I make to make my daily work easier. That's not the focus in Cascais. These two things can happen at the same time in these kinds of processes. So, yeah, it might be complex to determine type A, type B projects, but we're not working in a rush. We were gradually incorporating amendments, small changes, so that people adapt to the new decisions that are made before the start of each edition. Okay, Marta, could you please ask the last question? We need to conclude this meeting. I was going to ask precisely about this topic. So Nelson was just talking about how after four years of experts workshops about good practices, I find this model particularly insightful because it is based on good faith, so to speak. Everybody says this, but you really perceive in the details that sometimes that is not the ulterior motive. So for an urban planner like myself, the coexistence of public and private domains is fascinating. And you see, you have seen the reactions of all of us. It is shocking how you disrupt the competition principle. The main accesses that I've seen, I mean, sidewalks. I've seen examples of terrible sidewalks next to my place. They are right next to a road, so they are really inadequate. So what an amazing project you've got because model you've got because everything seems really organic, but it isn't. There are certain priorities. That translate to the details of each process, like the way you set up the tables to the public-private use of assets and the compelling way in which you tell us all of all about the the model. I find it really inspiring, fascinating, 
as a model, as a good practice that we can really learn from. Thank you for your presentation. Well, thank you very much. We are now going to close this meeting. We have made the most of the two hours we have. We could stay here forever because there are so many questions, remarks, observations. Unfortunately, we need to finish now. I think this is a clearly a success story, a success model because of many different reasons and because how delicately everything is being done and how you think about acting in good faith about everything else, above everything else, that self-analysis, self-assessment is what is really allowing you to improve every year. Thank you very much, Nelson, for coming to the participatory group uh, workshops. Thank you for attending and thank you for the attendance of the master's uh, students uh, who are here so late with us. Thank you for your invite. It was a pleasure to join the participatory group, the university students. What an amazing group of people compelled by and fascinated by this uh, project. I'm always available and at your disposal. If you ever want to visit Cascais and Portugal, please let me know. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.